This is Mr. Strahan, and I'm going to be providing you with Audio for Educated, a memoir by Tara Westover. Uh, we're going to start by going to the epigraph. Uh, the epigraph typically is a set of quotes that explain why or the motivation an author uses um, whenever they write a book. Um, the past is beautiful because one never realizes an emotion at the time and expands later, and thus we don't have complete emotions about the present, only about the past. That's Virginia Woolf. I believe, finally, that education must be conceived as a continuing reconstruction of experience, that the process and the goal of education are one and the same thing. The authors note, this story is not about Mormonism, neither is it about any other form of religious belief. And that there are many types of people, some believers, some not, some kind, some not. The author disputes any correlation, positive or negative, between the two. Prologue. I'm standing on the red railway car that sits abandoned next to the barn. The wind soars, whipping my hair across my face and pushing a chill on the open neck of my shirt. The gales are strong this close to the mountain, as if the peak itself is exhaling. Down below, the valley is peaceful, undisturbed. Meanwhile, our farm dances, the heavy conifer trees sway slowly, while the sagebrush and thistles quiver, bowing before every puff and pocket of air. Behind me, a gentle hill slopes upward and stitches itself to the mountain base. If I look up, I can see the dark form of the Indian princess. The hill is paved with wild wheat. The conifers and sagebrush are soloists. The wheat field is a corps de ballet. Each stem following all the rest in bursts of movement, a million ballerinas bending one after the other as great gales dent their golden heads. The shape of that dent lasts only a moment, and it is as close as anyone gets to seeing wind. Turning toward our house on the hill, hillside, I see movements of a different kind, tall shadows stiffly pushing through the currents. My brothers are awake, testing the weather. I imagine my mother at the stove, hovering over bran pancakes. I picture my father hunched by the, by the back door, lacing his steel-toed boots and threading his callous hands into welding gloves. On the highway below, the school bus rolls past without stopping. I am only seven, but I understand that it is this fact more than any other that makes my family different. We don't go to school. Dad worries that the government will force us to go, but it can't because it doesn't know about us. Four of my children, seven children, don't have birth certificates. We have no medical records because we were born at home and have never seen a doctor or nurse. We have no school records because we've never set foot in a classroom. When I am nine, I will be issued a delayed certificate of birth, but at this moment, according to the state of Idaho and the federal government, I do not exist. Of course, I did exist. I had grown up preparing for the days of abomination, watching for the sun to darken, for the moon to drip as if with blood. I spent my summers bottling peaches and my winters rotating supplies. When the world of men failed, my family would continue on unaffected. I had been educated in the rhythms of the mountain, rhythms in which change was never fundamental, only cyclical. The same sun appeared each morning, swept over the valley, and dropped behind the peak. The snows that fell in winter always melted in the spring. Our lives were a cycle, the cycle of the day, the cycle of the seasons, circles of perpetual change that, when complete, meant nothing had changed at all. I believed my family was a part of this immortal pattern, that we were in some sense eternal, but eternity belonged only to the mountain. There's a story my father used to tell about the peak. She was a grand old thing, a cathedral of a mountain, arranged at other mountains, taller, more imposing, but Buck's Peak was the most finely crafted. Its base spanned a mile, its dark form swelling out of the earth and rising into a flawless spire. From a distance, you could see the impression of a woman's body on the mountain face. Her legs formed of huge ravines, her hair a spray of pines standing over the northern ridge. Her stance was commanding, one leg thrust forward in a powerful movement, more stride than step. My father called her the Indian Princess. She emerged each year when the snow began to melt, facing south, watching the buffalo return to the valley. Dad said the nomadic Indians had watched for her appearance as a sign of spring, a signal the mountain was thawing, winter was over, and it was time to come home. All my father's stories were, above, were about our mountain, our valley, our jagged little patch of Idaho. He never told me what to do if I left the mountain, if I crossed oceans and continents and found myself in strange terrain, where I could no longer search the horizon for the princess. He never told me how I'd know when it was time to come home.